welcome to the October 13, 2021 City Council Work Session. Thank you for joining us in this remote meeting format we're using as our state and community continue to deal with COVID-19. This format enables the City Council to meet and take care of business while keeping everyone safe. <laughs> for work sessions like this one where there is no opportunity for public comment, those wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website, the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21, or by calling into one of the phone numbers listed on for this meeting on the public webcast and meeting materials web page. And with that, I thank you again for joining us, and I will turn this right over to the city manager for our one and only item of business today. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm super excited about this topic. As you know, we're spending a lot of time on, on homelessness, and part of that is, is really about our larger housing, uh, housing plan. So I'm excited to be joined by that team today. I do want to just uh, remind everybody, I'm actually going to have to jump off this meeting about 1245, and Christy is here. I'm uh, participating in that and the LCC presidential search committee and that had a, a slight overlap today. So I'm going to turn it over to our planning and development director, Denny Bro. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Um, as Sarah mentioned, the entire work session today is going to be dedicated to housing, uh, more specifically our housing implementation pipeline, which is better known as the HIP. And today you're going to hear from a few staff, but I just want to emphasize that many others have been working on this, many other staff. It's a really large team. It's a comprehensive issue. We have multiple departments represented on the team that's been working on the HIP. So I, I just want to first extend some thanks to the extensive team. They've done a lot of great work, and hopefully you'll see that reflected in the progress that they've made today. And secondly, um, as you know, this housing work is really important. Uh, we know that housing affordability, availability, diversity, one way or another affects just about everyone in the commu community. We know that our housing market and the housing system is stressed at every level where there are mismatches between income levels and housing costs, where there is low housing inventory pretty much at every, every level across the community. And we also know that we have limited tools and resources to address housing issues. So it's very important for us to have a plan and measurable goals so that we can most efficiently and effectively leverage these resources to address housing needs throughout the community. And that we need to work together and partner well to achieve the results that we want and need. So with that said, what you'll see today is that this plan is being developed and that it's very action oriented and that you'll see that we're working on a five-year plan that aligns resources to create a pipeline of projects and outcome that we believe could really help move the dial in the community's favor over time. So I'm excited to hand this over to Amanda and the HIP team to start and really share their great work. So thank you for being here. Good afternoon. I'm Amanda Noble Flannery, Senior Analyst in Community Development. We're excited to be back today to provide an update on the Housing Implementation Pipeline. Joining me in presenting will be Will Dowdy, Community Development Director, Brooke Freed, City Manager's Office Director, and Alyssa Hansen, Planning Director. We're representing a truly cross-city collaboration that includes those divisions plus Building and Permit Services, Public Works Engineering, the city attorney's office and central finance. You'll note today's work session is 90 minutes. As you know, housing is a complicated subject and we have a lot to cover. We have about 25 minutes of presentation for you to give you an update on the work we've done so far and to preview what we're planning to include in the HIP document. We're not asking for any decisions today. You'll recall this very appropriate image from your March work session where we kicked off how we want to establish a better way to do housing at the city, a way to coordinate current and future resources, goals and priorities, to move into a systems thinking approach to housing. And the unveiling of the HIP concept. The HIP is a five year internal work plan for housing across the full spectrum from people experiencing homelessness to overall housing supply. 
Over the past few months, our cross-departmental team has been building off of the housing tools and strategies success. We're working to connect dots and pinpoint areas of improvement across the spectrum of the city's housing efforts. This is the HIP creation timing we have planned. Today's work session is shown, followed by three additional work sessions. In November, we will review the draft document with you. In December, we'll discuss the HIP and downtown housing. And in January is an opportunity to review and take action on the final document. In between number two and number three, we'll do outreach to our housing related committees. And during this time, you have other related upcoming council items, renter protections, funding source for climate change and homelessness, middle housing code public hearing and growth monitoring. While we're looking at the timeline, I'll add that the HIP period is drafted to be FY 23 to 27. So that would start this coming July. You recognize this continuum that we introduced at the March work session at the core of the HIP. And it's been referenced at other housing specific work sessions since then. The continuum lens reveals housing as a system, meaning the goals, programs, and services across the continuum relate to and impact one another allowing community members to move through the entirety of the continuum as they are able. Attachment B in your packet includes the specific definitions for each of the bubbles. And I'll pass it over to Will for the next portion. Thank you. First of all, we, we know that each circle in that continuum graphic doesn't represent the same number of people in our community. And so the graphics on this slide provide a little bit of analysis about distribution across this housing continuum. If you take a look at this chart, the, the chart on the left, you can see bars representing the number of house households who fall within each of the income brackets that are represented by different housing levels. Those, those are the three bars on the, on the right, the right hand of the left graphic. Um, the number on the, on the left, the 2405, is um, the number of unhoused individuals who show up in our community. And so what you've got is you've got a number of housed individuals and then you've got a number of households that aren't housing. So it's, it's actually two graphics in one. I apologize for that. But it gives you a little bit of a sense of the number of people that we're talking about, whether they're individuals or households and how they arrange or are arranged across this continuum. And it gives you a little bit of sense of, of how, how many people fall within each of the different circles. It's not it's not something that can be, um, you know, it's not a super precise thing, but it does give you a sense of, of how our community is distributed economically. You can see there's about a third of our housed households in the community that are in the affordable housing range, a significant but lesser segment in the moderate income housing range, and then a slightly larger segment in the market rate housing. And those are for housed households. The chart on the right maps out the potential investments described in the HIP. You can see the inclusion of the homeless part of the continuum as spending categories, and you can see the prominent shift or prominent role that affordable housing plays in our investment approach. That's the, by far the, the largest of the bars. And generally, there's a shift to the left side of the continuum compared to the population categories shown on the left. Next slide, please. And now we're going to get a little bit more complicated. This slide compares the number of housing units, uh, sorry, the number of households within different income levels and the corresponding number of housing units. It's about the number of units that exist in our community, not what's available or empty. That's, and that's an important point. It's, it's complex, uh, complex information, and it's trying to describe an com extremely complex system. So I'll unpack it a little bit for you. The dark blue bars represent the number of households at each income level, and this is all using 2019 data. The lighter bars show the number of housing units that correspond to those income levels. So households in dark blue and corresponding units in, in, in lighter gray. The first thing to note is that this is necessarily an, an abstraction because you can think about different households that have that on paper might look the same. So uh, two households that are each making $50,000, if one of them has one person in it and one's an intergenerational family, they're going to have, uh, they're going to experience that $50,000 differently. And so, so that's where you can't quite just say everyone's the same and people aren't just the statistics, but that's where this is an abstraction that it's, it's useful for us to talk about. 
Next, when you compare the number of households and the number of units, you can see that there's a housing deficit on the, the bars on the left. These are households that are making less than $25,000. And you can see um, a deficit also on the right. And these are households that are making $100,000 or more. The middle of the range does not have a deficit. And perhaps you're wondering what's going on because it seems to be broadly recognized that households, even in that $25,000 to $100,000 range are also experiencing their share of difficulty finding housing. As Denny mentioned at the beginning, the, the statistics are, are, um, are noticeable across the entire housing spectrum. Um, we've seen our, our vacancy levels for rental housing units drop by 50% or perhaps much more um, over the, the last 10 years. And, um, and the latest reports that I've seen is show that there's less than one month of, of inventory in the uh, for sale market um, available at any time, which is well below what is considered healthy. So here's a couple of scenarios now that I wanna show that show how this gets more complicated for, for different folks. Imagine a household on the lower end of the spectrum. Let's say it's a household making $20,000 a year. So you see that they fall into one of those ranges where there's a big deficit. They may make a personal choice, a good choice or a bad choice, depending on their personal situation to spend twice um, what they should on housing. And that may save them a commute. Um, that, that may be a good or bad financial decision for them. It, but it does create them, or put them into a situation of being extremely cost burdened for housing. And it also means that they are, um, they even though they show up as a household on the left end, they're uh, affording a, house, a housing unit that's somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. So that's one reason why um, their painful situation may reduce what appears to be a surplus of housing units in the middle. A happier version could be a hypothetical retiree who paid off a house mortgage during their working years. They may have a reduced income paired with a reduction in personal expenses. Meanwhile, their house may have only gone up in value. That creates, a, a again, that creates a mismatch, perhaps good for the household, but complicating this analysis. On the other side of the spectrum, you may have a household that is faced with the deficit of housing on the upper end of the chart. And so they find themselves either leaving the community or more likely looking at rental or purchase options again, that statistically don't match their incomes, but it's what's available. And so that's where you see um, in, in both situations or in all these situations, um, they're all hypothetical, but it comes down to the fact that housing is a spectrum. Human beings have a myriad of reasons why they will need to make personal decisions. The deficits that we see on this chart can cause problems for people in those categories, but they also create spillover impacts that affect the households that are in the apparent, apparent surplus zone. So as Amanda mentioned at the beginning, um, Oh, I'm sorry. That's that's it for this slide. And I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Next, what we want to tell you about is is kind of taking this as background information and moving into um, looking at the elements of the hip. We'll be bringing you back a draft of the hip in November, and that's what Amanda mentioned that when she went through the timeline. So this work session is an opportunity to share and review key elements that will shape that draft. You have more information about these elements in your AIS attachments, and we're going to run through them now, starting with the goals for the HIP, uh, then moving into the forecasted city supported housing and shelter pipeline, which is thinking about how that units specifically support the goals. We're going to talk to you about a couple of additional investment opportunities that could change the number of units that are in play to support the goals of the HIP, and finally talk about um, the opportunity for housing policies and programs that um, can create a long lasting impact across the community. So starting with the portion of the continuum that includes homeless individuals, these two year and five year goals incorporate existing sheltering goals for the city's current unhoused response work, as well as existing goals for our homeless programs funded through the community safety initiative and key goals for the homeless system transformation work that the city has been engaged in in partnership with, with Lane County. Over the next two years, staff will continue to focus on increasing access to safe shelter and supportive services to help homeless community members stabilize and ultimately move toward better circumstances. The first goal here for 250 new safe sleep spaces is part of the current unified command work to create 500 new spaces overall. Because the HIP period starts in FY23, 
This goal assumes that we'll be successful in creating at least 250 spaces in FY22. We're currently well on our way with the opening of 310 Garfield and other recently approved sites. If we're successful in adding more than 250 units in this current fiscal year, this FY23 goal could be adjusted accordingly. We're also collaborating with Lane County on the 75 bed low barrier shelter and navigation center at 100 River Avenue, which is currently anticipated to open in July 2022, uh, the start of FY23. Critical to the success of these and other city shelter programs is access to supportive services that help people to stabilize. Resources like housing navigation and case management help to support people to move along the continuum. We work with the county and other partners to provide these important services to program participants. As you've heard through the pandemic, social service provider capacity is crucial to expanding shelter and supportive services. So we'll continue to work together with the county and social service providers to increase provider capacity. In addition to shelter capacity, we also want to ensure that we provide support and connections for unsheltered individuals that are not currently in city sponsored shelter programs. To achieve this, we plan to continue partnering with Lane County on a street outreach program in Eugene that is well connected to shelter and housing programs. As part of our unhoused response work, we'll also continue to work on ensuring that the city response processes are coordinated to support the health, safety, and well being of unsheltered and sheltered individuals. So as we consider the long range goals for the homeless portion of the continuum, we continue to recognize the importance of collaboration and coordination in this work. We anticipate continuing to collaborate with Lane County as we have through the current homeless system transformation work, but recognizing that our understanding of the scale and scope of the population has continued to evolve. We also imagine engaging with a broader range of partners through a regional initiative. That would, this would help us to close some of the current gaps in the system. As we expand this integrated network of services, we'll need to continue to ensure that there are highly functioning pathways to match individuals to the appropriate resources and long-term housing options, such as permanent supportive housing. So improvements to the coordinated entry system will remain critical. As part of this work to close the gaps, as well as prevent individuals from entering into homelessness in the first place, this will mean cultivating cultivating partnerships with entities that have expertise in these areas. Examples include improving access to healthcare, addiction and mental health services, access to one-time diversion resources and workforce development. Areas where the city is not necessarily the direct provider or lead agency, but a partner in the work. This could also include the city's engaging in federal and state advocacy supporting these important services. With that, I'll turn it over to Amanda, who will talk about the next area in the continuum, which includes the permanent supportive housing piece that I mentioned. Great. The income qualified housing goals is a combination of the affordable housing bubble and the moderate income housing bubble, both of which is housing where people have to income qualify to live in the units. The draft goals include supporting developers to preserve and construct a specific number of income qualified units with a specific focus on increasing affordable rental and home ownership opportunities during the HIP period for both the two and five year goals. Investing in the development of new permanent supportive housing units for people who are experiencing chronic homelessness. And I'll talk more about the italicized two year goal number four later in the presentation when we discuss potential additional investment opportunities. If the city assistance is pursued, a set unit goal could be added to the income qualified housing goals shown here. For five year goals, they include permanent supportive housing units that get us to the Lane County Shelter Feasibility Study Goal for single adults, that's 75% of the 350 units at 263 units. Utilizing city owned land for redevelopment sites for affordable housing, 13th and Chambers, 33rd and Hilliard, and the Downtown Riverfront, Lot 2, that's owned by the Urban Renewal Agency. Lastly, embedding fair housing opportunities in redevelopments to the greatest extent possible. Next, Alyssa will talk about the overall housing supply goals. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so as you'll see that uh, these goals only include five-year goals, um, really because of the unpredictability of the housing market and the time necessary for new projects to develop. 
Um, as Will had mentioned earlier, there really is demand across the entire housing continuum for housing. So this goal focuses on the three housing bubbles, and there really is overlap between this and the goals that Amanda mentioned in the income qualified. So those uh, are in play here as well. And honestly, it includes housing across the city and across the housing types. So everything from accessory dwellings to apartment buildings and everything in between. So the first goal is to permit the construction of 6,000 housing units. So this equates to an average of, of the city issuing about 12,000 permits per year for houses. Um, in comparison, over the last 20 years, we've issued roughly 800 permits per year. So we're uh, proposing to uh, the goal to be a 400 unit increase per year. And the reason for this is twofold. First, it's to address our expected population growth. We know we're growing. And the second is actually to address the existing housing shortage. Um, we're, it's showing that we've had an underproduction of units and we really need to be able to catch up um, to you know, the number of houses that we need. Again, this is all housing types, including, and it includes the income qualified housing um, that Amanda mentioned previously. So in addition to you know, increasing the number of units um, in the community, we also wanna think about the impact of those units on our community. So the second goal is about drafting an anti-displacement plan in a tight housing market like in Eugene, low income and vulnerable community members are most at risk for involuntary displacement from their neighborhoods. This can be due to increased market values, rents or changes in their neighborhood's basic amenities. Displacement has been shown to perpetuate negative health impacts and access to health care, health care and other opportunities, and it can also have a negative impact on household income and how kids fare in school. Creating this action plan will help us achieve equitable housing access and benefit the health for all in our community. There are a number of strategies and tools that would be explored in the creation of this plan and some of the related work um, and some which will be coming forward to you soon uh, includes renter protections as well as home ownership assistance, rental assistance and the preservation of naturally occurring housing units. The third goal is about how we do our work and it's about incorporating an equity lens into our work, which means committing to embedding equity lens processes in the city's housing work for the goal of creating more equitable outcomes. And there's really two parts to doing this. The first is quantitative using um, data-driven analysis to understand who benefits and who is burdened by particular actions. And this would be paired with qualitative engagement. So reaching out and listening to historically underrepresented and at-risk communities. And using this type of tool or tools will help staff and decision makers um, make Eugene, continue to make Eugene a welcome, or make Eugene a welcoming, inclusive, and safe community for everyone. And the final goal under the housing supply, overall housing supply, is to increase the amount of housing downtown by 50%. So I think as we mentioned in a previous work session, uh, we were really inspired by Beaverton's housing action plan as a model and inspiration for the HIP. And they have a specific goal that was that's uh, for downtown in, in terms of number of units. And we were really intrigued by that. And the more we thought about it, the more it really made sense. I think, as we all know, downtown is the heart and soul of our community. It's our economic, cultural, and social and civic center. And a healthy and vibrant downtown is a key to a strong community. Housing is a critical component to uh, create an economically vital and livable downtown. Um, during, it's been interesting during the pandemic when many people stayed home and didn't venture past their neighborhoods that the impacts downtown were and continue to be visible. I think one of the reason, well, one of the reasons for this is downtown has depended heavily on offices for its vitality and with folks working from home, it's become something of a monoculture. So we're looking at really you know, increasing the housing down here. I'm downtown right now, I'm not at home. Um, increasing the housing in downtown um, really to, to help with that vibrancy. Uh, more housing downtown also just squarely aligns with the city's policies in the climate action plan, the 
uh, transportation system plan and envision Eugene around climate, transportation, and, and economy. Uh, compact development means less miles traveled, which also reduces our climate impacts and has other uh, benefits to the community. Um, in terms of numbers, uh, we, there are roughly 2,200 housing units downtown now, so this would equate to a little more than 1,000 units in the next five years. And just to note that these are a subset of the 6,000 units um, mentioned in the first goal. I think this is ambitious, but an achievable goal. Um, and just one thing to note is it when we say downtown, we're talking about the downtown plan boundary that was adopted in the early 2000s. It, it includes more than just the, the core of downtown. In fact, it goes all the way to the downtown riverfront site as well. Will is gonna be talking a little bit more about this potential investment opportunity related to downtown later in this presentation. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Amanda. In addition to compiling and drafting goals for the HIP, staff also forecasted capacity for existing programs and anticipated resources, both funding and real property, which is land. With this information, we were, we were able to create a forecasted number of shelter beds and housing units that could be constructed or preserved with direct city investment from existing programs over the HIP period. Attachment C has this table with the additional detail of breaking out the number of preserved units and home ownership units. We provided the continuum bubble areas on the left side, the past five year actual numbers next to that, and then the estimated current year units for FY22. Then the hit period information is in the remaining four columns. You'll see that we listed the forecasted tools at a high level that would be involved in getting those units. The unit counts represent the timing when a unit becomes available for lease or sale, rather than when the city awards funds, when construction starts, or when a project is closed out in the federal recording system. So I'd like to explain the presumed and contingent columns. A presumed unit or bed is in a project that receives city support and has all of the funding needed to start construction. Requests for proposals that include city-owned land are assumed to create presumed units. Notably, presumed units are not guaranteed units, especially for affordable housing projects, which face multiple challenges up to completion. A contingent unit or bed is in a project that receives city support, but that does not have all of the funding needed to start construction. Requests for proposals that do not include city-owned land and all permanent supportive housing projects are assumed to create contingent units. So this is the forecast from existing programs and sources. In doing this work, we did identify two potential additional investment opportunities. We included these in your packet in attachment G. The first is city fee assistance for affordable housing projects. Similar to the funding council has approved the past two December supplemental budgets for FY20 and FY21. The basic idea here is to be able to move those affordable housing units from the contingent column to the presumed column. That's just under 700 units that would be anticipated to receive investments through other city programs, but that do not have all of the subsidy needed to start construction. The city fee assistance could also support some units each year in affordable housing projects that are not already receiving other city support. The Keystone and the Sarung are two recent projects that benefited from this kind of support. I'll pass it to Will to talk about the second opportunity. Alyssa shared a draft goal related to downtown housing. Our current pipeline anticipates the creation of hundreds of units at the downtown riverfront and 129 units at 1059 Willamette, which is the old LCC building. With these projects, we could be well on our way to meeting the majority of the draft goal. And a look back at our last five years suggests that our existing tools and incentives will help support the creation of additional units. We've identified downtown as an investment opportunity because there are different ways that we can approach this goal. Council could decide that it's best to rely on the current pipeline and the existing tools to reach this goal of a 50% increase in housing, 
or could choose to reduce the unit target for downtown. Another option would be to provide additional incentives for downtown housing, such as providing funds to pay for the permit fees and system, system development charges for either mixed income housing, market rate housing, or a blend of both. Another consideration is the geographic distribution of these units. With the exception of the proposed housing at 1059 Willamette, the housing built downtown in the last five years and all the housing in the pipeline is north, northeast, or east of the downtown core, which is something that has been brought to our attention um, a number of times by people who are focused on downtown. Targeted investment could be a way to incentivize new units that are geographically located in the middle of downtown. As Alyssa mentioned earlier, downtown housing is impactful, impactful for a number of reasons, and we'll be coming back for a standalone work session in December to give you more time on it, including this question of investment opportunities. The last focus area summary for this presentation is the potential policy and program exploration timeline that was in attachment E of your packet. The timeline shows work related to housing that may need council attention over the next five years and if additional resources are needed in order to explore them. Some are state mandates and some are city initiatives. A few examples are listed on the slide. The timeline also includes various housing work already in progress so that the timeline is really a one-stop experience for what's happening or potentially in line to happen in the future. This is not an exhaustive list of all the work that we are doing on housing. It does not include our normal work with federal grants. Still, it's a helpful tool to see the timing for how the city potentially could do future policy and program exploration depending on the resources available. So we've gone through a lot in this presentation and I wanna take a minute to zoom back out and end on the big picture. The HIP will be a unified work plan to allow staff to coordinate across departments and execute policy direction efficiently and effectively. It's important to have clear goals on what we're aiming for so we make progress. The, help, the HIP will help us leverage the limited resources to stretch them as far as possible to help with housing in the community because housing touches everyone. As a reminder, we're not asking for any decisions today and we'll be back in November with a draft HIP document for your review. And with that, we'll open it up for council discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I actually feel as if I'm going to have to listen to this presentation around about three times and read the packet a few times because it is so full of information. So I feel like I'm just grasping it up here and there's all of this deeper understanding down here. So I look forward to hearing the um, counselors' questions and I see that Mike is already in the queue. So Mike, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. It's strange that I would do that, I know, but... Um... Thank you to staff very much for all the hard work. Um, there's there's very little that we could be doing, I think, other than issues around homelessness and housing that are more important for us to be focused on right now. So this is a really ambitious plan and 6,000 units is a lot of units in the next five years, 1,200 a year. That's awesome. I Where does that leave us with regard to our um, when we set the UGB, somebody's going to have to correct my numbers. I think it was 8,400 um, single family, and it was 4,600, 40. I don't remember the numbers <clears throat> by 2035 that we wanted to build. Where, do, where does this leave us with relation to that is my first question. Um, so it, it is a little bit of a different number because what we were averaging over the 20 year UGB period or what we were anticipating was about 750 units per year. And like I said, we're building about 800 per year, but this would be bumping that up to 1200 per year. Um, so it would actually, but it's just for that five year period, right? Not the 20 year period. And you'll be happy to know that the growth monitoring folks have been very much involved in this um, and we'll be coming back with more details for you related to growth monitoring soon. Um, but we have, you know, we've really definitely worked closely with them in terms of these numbers and, you know, and the source of those numbers. 
Lisa, thank you very much again for all the hard work and thank you for teeing up the next question so well. <clears throat> when we had the uh, <clears throat> our, our work session on Monday, one of the things we learned was, as I'm sure you know, with the census, we saw 30,000 new people in the decade coming to Eugene. We, we planned for the period of 2015 to 2035, we, we planned with those numbers for 34,000 new people in that time frame. So realistically, half of the time frame, one could say we saw 15,000 new people in that five year of the 20, a quarter over the period. In other words, that could translate that instead of the 34,000 that we planned for, we should really be on a target for 60,000 uh, as, a, as, a, as a goal for the population increase based on what we've seen. Can you talk about that relative to growth monitoring and what you guys are seeing with, you know, relatively double the population growth that we planned for? I am not prepared to answer that question today, but I do, I mean, when growth monitoring comes back and the, you get your first growth monitoring report, it will address population growth and it will address housing trends and all of those things that you were very interested in and that are important to our community. Um, yeah. We'll just, I'll note, you're right, we're using a population forecast that's from 2009 and that's clearly the methodology and how that happens has changed since then. And our UGB period is from 2012 to 2032, which also doesn't quite align, you know, with some of the numbers we're seeing out there. So, uh, you know, Heather and her team will be bringing to you more information um, and it will absolutely be part of your growth monitoring conversation. And that's awesome. That was a pillar I fought for pretty hard for us to be able to adjust as we go and for us to recognize that if we undershot when we didn't add land to the UGB, that maybe it would be wise for us to reconsider that decision if what we found was that our planning was insufficient. And I don't need further proof that it was personally. Um, I, I think we undershot dramatically. So with the with the mix, you, you we planned at that time for a 55-45 split. Is that the same as it applies to the 6,000 homes? We didn't put a split on this 6,000 homes. It's just 6,000 homes. We didn't get into that level of detail of which types of homes and location or you know where. So it's just a you know a gross number. I have a bunch more questions in 15 seconds, so I'll need a second round, Mayor. But um, on if if you did that split at the same level, you'd have 660 single-family homes that need to be built per year in those five. So my question would be on what land, I mean, where do you see those large chunks of land to be able to build developments rather than one-offs to hit that number? I think that's something I'm gonna to have to follow up on. I will say that, you know, uh, we're gonna see, we're already starting to see more ADUs, which are considered in the single family class. And, um, but the rest of it, I will, I'll have to follow up. Okay, thank you. I'll need a second round, Mayor. Thanks. Got it. Thank you, uh, Claire, and then Randy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, thank you so much for this great um, briefing and for laying out a plan in in such a a complicated plan in what I find to be a very coherent fashion. Um, so I I and I particularly want to appreciate the framework that helps us connect the crisis we're having around folks who are unsheltered and what we've got uh, happening in terms of our need to support the creation of more housing, whether that's publicly subsidized housing or market rate housing. Um, and, and so uh, making those connections is, is very, very important. I really appreciated um, attachment E which was one of the slides as well, which is the timeline with all our various um, policy um, pieces. And then I also uh, really appreciate the chart uh, with the totals as well. Um, 
puts it in, in, in perspective. And, and I also really appreciated the chart um, showing range of incomes and housing options to meet those incomes. I think that's some important analysis that has been missing from some of our conversation. We've referred to it, but we haven't seen data. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I agree with Councillor Clark, it's very ambitious, but I also think it's very necessary. Um, and I just want to note for this council and the general public that this housing deficit is, is actually a nationwide housing deficit. Um, it's, it's particularly acute on the West Coast. Um, it's not uh, specific to Eugene or even Oregon. It, it really started in the wake of the 2008 Great Recession when housing starts basically stopped for a, uh, you know almost two years and we've never really caught up as a country. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that we are caught up in a larger dynamic. And I'm so excited that we're taking this very focused and thoughtful approach to how do we dig ourselves out of that and perhaps even get ahead if that's even possible. I did have one question and, and this could come back at our next update on this, but I, I'd really like to learn more about what an anti-displacement plan might look like. Um, if there are models in other communities, this is obviously a huge concern for folks in Eugene, particularly folks who are renters, um, when their property, you know, that they have no control over is perhaps sold and upscaled and then they can't afford it anymore. Um, so that's one piece I'd like some follow up um, at our next meeting with, on this would be fine. Thank you. Thank you, Randy and then Jennifer. Thank you, Mayor. And I've got a lot of uh, noise going on outside of the location I'm at. So if it becomes too disruptive, let me know and I'll sign off and then come back in uh, maybe later in the queue. Um, I appreciate uh, the questions and comments that were made by both uh, Mike and Claire. I think it gets at some of where my concern is. I too am concerned about the effects on our lower end uh, members of our community and renters. Uh, I'm very interested in hearing more in the future presentations on what we have in the way of programs that can help leverage people into um, uh, home ownership, because that's, that is how people can prepare themselves, you know, all the way up to retirement. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, do we have numbers, accompanying numbers uh, of units represented in the percentages on slide eight for the less than 25,000 annual income? Uh, I don't know if someone can do the quick math on that, but we, we, have, we have the means of getting back to you with that. And, and that's even fine if that's in a, a future presentation, but that's something that's, that's important to me um, to understand. I, I, I really like the aggressiveness and I agree with Claire that we need to be aggressive in order to solve this. I think our unhoused situation and our um, uh, housing situation are, are two of the biggest challenges that are facing our community and many others. But uh, I, I'm wondering the 400% increase, I'll be interested in future presentations of hearing what that strategy actually looks like. And does it take into account um, supply chain challenges and labor shortages that I know there are a problem in construction right now. And I, I just want to make sure we have, we're folding in realistic explanations uh, when we develop policy around this, but also as we communicate with our, our public. Um, a, a question, another question I have that falls more in the unhoused um, arena, but it does tie to housing, is where do unhoused, uh, unaccompanied youth fall into this uh, housing continuum? Councillor Groves, um, those uh, individuals aren't distinguished um, by age necessarily when we look at that population. And so um, when Will showed the Eugene numbers previously across that spectrum, those would be included um, within the um, unsheltered or sheltered or overlapping programs. Um, the city of Eugene supports um, primarily alternative shelter programs targeted at uh, adults, um, but the city also supports um, programs that support uh, homeless youth um, through uh, CSI and other means. 
thank you. I, I, I know we have other programs. It's something that's that's concerning me. I've heard from some of our uh, nonprofit partners in working that right now, even some of the work that we are doing as a city, which I think is good work around our unhoused communities, um, there's still a uh, dearth of, of housing for people in that consider in that uh, category. And, and our youth should not be just folded in with, with adults. Um, that is of concern to me and something I hope we can dig into a little more later, whether it's around housing or part of our unhoused uh, updates and strategies. Um, I like, um, well, actually, that's all I have for now. I, 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 I will be tracking this closely. I'm very interested in, in everything that you're all doing. It sounds great. I just want to make sure we're matching reality uh, of our conditions that we have with our aspirations. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, and then Greg. Thank you. So first, I just want to say you can tell a lot of coordination and work went into this. This is very impressive. And um, I really also, like others, um, appreciated the way it was presented and the charts. And and it, it was just, it's very complicated, but it seems like it's understandable, I hope. Like the mayor, I'll probably have to read it again, <laughs> but I appreciate that. I did want to make sure I understand um, op opportunity number one. So is this essentially looking for projects that are almost there and we're just going to give them that little extra they need to to make it a fully viable project maybe yes that's correct <laughs> i wanted to make sure i understood it before i say i think that's a great idea um that makes a lot of sense right why go out looking for a brand new thing when you have a viable project right there that just needs a little extra help get it over the finish line. That's fantastic. Um, I also think investing in our downtown makes a lot of sense. Um, you don't have to answer this today, but I'd be interested to find out at some point in here, you mentioned that 20% of the downtown housing is affordable housing with a little over 2000 units total. I'm interested to find out um, what percentage are owner occupied if we actually have um, a percentage of, of the units that are available that people can purchase. Um, I also was very interested in the anti-displacement plan and very impressed that it's part of this. I think that obviously it should be and it makes a lot of sense. And so I'm glad to see it. But I also um, don't really know what that would look like or what people have tried that has been has not worked and what they have tried that has worked. So I'd appreciate more information on that as well. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, and then Matt. Um, I'm going to follow up a little bit on uh, Jennifer's last comment um, about displacement. Uh, we're going through some displacement issues in Ward 6, uh, particularly with uh, at least one trailer park that we have um, or manufactured uh, home park that we have. And I think that that's going to trend, a trend that's going to continue. But that's not my question. So my question is this, um, what has the analysis been done about um, the type of, or I should say the demographics of the, uh, the people that are going to be coming into the community, um, where they're gonna live, how they're gonna live, are we gonna be creating um, uh, areas that are ghettoized uh, because of price and possibly also because of affordability and race. Uh, I'll note that Springfield has grown to the point where almost 20% of their population is Latino, Latina. Um, I want to see us be able to have uh, a way to make sure that our housing distribution policies will have a significant effect on making sure that uh, people of all kinds have access to affordable housing in all areas of the city, not just downtown or out Highway 99, but all areas of the city. 
uh, that's the way that we're going to have a healthy community is to basically make sure that that community is integrated. So, um, and I haven't had a chance to go in depth on this. So talk to me about the equity lens work around that issue and how, uh, what are the uh, specific strategies that the equity lens will be incorporated as we look at this growth model? Sounds like you've asked a couple of different questions there, including the um, uh, a look at the the demographics. And I don't know if, if Alyssa, that's something you have offhand, or if, if we can maybe get back to you about the the demographics of, of who's coming into the community and, and how they um, kind of what economic situation they have when they come in and, and what what that leaves them with uh, once they get here. So that's perhaps something that we can follow up with you about. It would be helpful, Will, because of the last few years that I know of, people who have wanted to uh, locate in Eugene haven't been able to locate because of affordability. And the affordable units that are in this community are mostly over in Springfield and some of the outer areas like Junction City and Cottage Grove. So we, we can we can get more into that um, at a future opportunity. Uh, Amanda, do you have any information to talk about the, kind of the other part of this question with um, how we look at equitable distribution or is that something that you think we also need to come back with more information at follow up? Genevieve is here and she might have some information to share at this time. Hey, thank you. That's a great question, Councillor Evans. I have been working on developing um, the HIPS Equity Lens Toolkit. So what that looks like, um, and to Councillor Ye's point um, and Councillor Sret's point is looking at other cities' models of what has and hasn't worked, um, models that are longer standing and newer models and seeing different um, processes that they're using. And so the processes look like uh, policy, um, policy lenses, process lenses, staff models, and then engagement practices. And so what I'm doing is developing uh, a draft equity lens toolkit. We're going to run that by both the uh, equity panel that we have for the city. So have some community engagement on that, get their opinions, and then also the NAACP housing committee and talk with them um, about some of the best practices that we're finding and then run that by um, community for how they think that that will work or not work for our community. And then yeah. we will get more information for you in the next uh, agenda packet. Yeah, I'm encouraged by that. I, I'm working on the same thing in my day job, uh, building an equity lens that's going to be effective for Lane Community College. Uh, but the last thing on that is, um, I don't want to see us have the same kind of effect that happened in northern and western cities vis-a-vis -vis the great migration of the uh, early 20th and mid 20th centuries. We could be drawing areas around places where people don't want to live to next, next to each other because of race, or ethnicity, or culture. Thank you for that conversation. Um, Matt, you're up next. Thank you, Mayor. I'm adding my voice to uh, uh, wanting to learn more about an anti-displacement plan at our next or earliest opportunity. I um, am alarmed by some, uh, some, some of the uh, data points, including but not limited to, uh, I believe Will mentioned a decrease of 50% of housing availability over the last, was that a 10 year period, Will? Yes, uh, we had a 5% vacancy rate in 2010 and a 2.5% vacancy rate in 2019. And I, uh, I've heard reports of 1% of or less uh, currently. What are, what are the top three reasons just off the top of your head why that might be? Um, I, that's a, a great question. I mean, I think it's um, uh, for rental vacancy, it's, it's going to have to just be more people interested in renting and, and uh, not the corresponding increase in number of units. 
I mean, I think that's that's the heart of it, and I mean, that's it's kind of just a definition, I guess, of what that means. But the um, but uh, any number of reasons, I guess, would support why that's happening. Is it a fair assessment that wage stagnation would contribute significantly as rental prices spike and wages stay relatively low? No. Yes. I, I think that could come into play, um, but but I, I think maybe a little bit more indirectly because what that's going to do is that's going to um, uh, that's going to be a determining factor in whether someone who is in a position to develop more rental units makes that decision to. And so there, um, because when units, new units come on the market, they're almost inevitably um, higher priced than a unit that's that same unit will be five years uh, ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so when the new units come on, uh, in order to get someone into a, a, a brand new housing unit, they, they need to have a little bit more financial capacity. They need to have more money. And so that's where the, the stagnation can come in is, is whether a, a, a developer and whether that's a, a large developer or a small, um, you know, just a community member doing a small project with, if they make that jump to develop uh, uh, more uh, rental units, that's going to be dependent on what they see as, as viable for them. Great. So along the, the spectrum and the, the continuum, and thank you for the work, by the way, and thank you especially for illustrating the investment and the quantitative snapshot of the number of community members affected across the continuum. Um, the goal is to get folks into more permanent, stable housing. And it seems as if we're, we're looking at, which is great work, I appreciate the 250 safe sleep sites, the 75 low barrier shelters, but it looks like if, if, if that's a base hit and scoring a run, it, it, the goal is permanent supportive housing, that we may be counting base hits and runs together. I would like to know what the goal is, especially if there are 2,400 unhoused individuals and we're addressing maybe 10 to 13% of, of housing those folks, what's the goal of getting that remaining 87%, 90% of unhoused folks into more permanent supportive shelters? And I'm going to um, pause there and insert a, 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 a just a note of recognition right here in South Eugene at the Nightingale rest stop. Uh, they claim that 70% of the folks who are housed at that emergency respite rest stop center move on to more su support a permanently supportive housing. So if that's the what's happening at Nightingale, is that happening across the board? And how do we how do we or where in this presentation or 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 what is the goal of moving folks who utilize our support services toward that that more permanent supportive housing? What, what, what percentage of the unhoused actually transition uh, to, to permanent supportive housing? Um, Councilor Keating, I'll try to take up a number of the, the, the individual questions you were asking. Um, one starting place I would say is that the goals that we have incorporated here are um, absorbing current council direction. So um, the overarching, so within the work that we've been doing with the county, um, the target for permanent supportive housing um, is 350 units. And so we're folding in those goals here into this plan. Um, we're not proposing new targets at this point, um, developing a work plan for what is what council direction has already been given. Um, when we look at the need for permanent housing, um, stable housing for unsheltered individuals, not all um, individuals need the level of support and services that is offered within permanent supportive housing. Um, and so within that work that we've been doing, um, while we're also working to build new units, um, there's a lot of aspects of the system that um, we also need to pay attention to. And so um, giving people access to services to stabilize, um, adding tenancy supports as part of that plan, working with landlords to ensure that there's other units available um, that can be open to individuals who have um, uh, resources that can get them into more of the distributed units rather than a permanent supportive project. So there's lots of ways that we want to support people into housing. Um, if we were to kind of attempt to get everyone into per permanent supportive housing, it's it's just not necessary for all, and it, it might not even be sort of what's what's most uh, desirable for those individuals longer term. We want to be able to get them back um, uh, amongst the community. 
Um, so, you know, I think as we look at the the work that we've been doing, uh, the, the work with the county, we want to be able to bring back some of the numbers in terms of how we're doing in that work. Um, the project with the county recently on MLK, um, we're learning a lot about those services, or that, that project and how that's been working. And so we'll continue to bring that information back and that will inform the new projects. We know that um, within the project that's currently underway, we've learned a lot and the county is working to apply that learning um, to that new program coming online to make sure that we have the right services. So um, we'll, we'll bring it additional information on that. But I think it's a good question about what the right number of permanent supportive housing units needs to be versus um, other housing options um, that have different levels of support depending on those individuals' needs. Does that help to answer your question? It, it does. The, 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 I, I, goal oriented and also realistic and and so looking at maybe what's working in other communities how realistic can council over a five ten year period properly meet our our stated goals and um i'll leave it there and i i look forward to a round i mayor i won't need a round two but i look forward to my colleagues questions in round two and i thank the staff for the presentation Thank you. Yeah, I have both Mike and Greg queued up for a second round, but I actually want to jump into the queue for a second with a question. So could you pull up the slide for attachment C, forecasted city supported housing and shelter pipeline? Yes, I will do that. Yes. Yes, thank you. thank you, thank you. So this, so I'm trying to understand this slide in the context of the 6,000 projected units for the future. So this is what we currently have in the pipeline. And so when the, so maybe you can just answer that without my trying to conjecture what I think it means. Sure, I will say some things and then Alyssa, you can jump in too. This is a chart that shows the units that we anticipate getting from the existing city resources. So this is using um, city involvement in all of those units. And the 6,000 units that Alyssa spoke to is all of the units that would be created in the city, um, including ones that we're not involved in at all, naturally occurring housing units. Right, okay, so this total number is 2,300. And then we're saying there will be just shy of 4,000 additional units that we have to realize in another way, either with creating another creating another fee or creating another opportunity. Right. And the I will point out the 2,300 total on here includes 325 shelter beds. Right. So. Right. It's actually more, there's more like 2,000 here in terms of permanent housing here. So we're looking at another 4,000 beyond what we currently have in the pipeline. Okay. Thank you. That helps me because it kind of dwells in the sort of specific challenge of what money is there and how much it would cost to get us to the next level. So I, I just, I very much appreciate the, the whole series of slides and the, the, the data in the beginning around you know, where the need is and what the what the costs are, the information that Will has shared with us, sort of teeing up the conversation about how we might create another revenue source. So thank you for that. I'm looking forward to hearing more. And um, all right, with that, I have Mike, then Greg, and then Claire. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> like, uh, well, first couple of questions. Um, sorry, Lissa. Would you say it's fair to say that of the 6,000 planned units that a majority that we're hoping to see built are market driven, or would you say that a majority needs to be subsidized in some way? Well, just building off what Amanda showed on that previous slide, I mean, 2,000 of them off the, you know, off the top require or are, will have some amount of city subsidy or incentive. Um, it was our other. Go ahead. I thought there were 550 that were market at the bottom. I'm sorry. Yeah, and that is true. That is true. Okay. But those so, are 
the downtown riverfront site. So it does have, those have some city involvement. Right. Yeah. My, my thinking was more along the lines of, as opposed to what's on the table right now that we know about versus the, you know, the environment, environment that we're hoping to create. So of those 6,000, does staff currently imagine that the majority of those will need subsidization of some kind or that the, or the majority of those will be market driven? And I am going to leave that to Will and Amanda. If they have got a, an answer for that, I will say there are a number of things to get more units. Some of the things are regulatory, which is not an incentive, but um, you right. know, the housing is going to really open up or could open up what we might see in terms of duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, um, your recent decision related to accessory dwellings, um, some of the incentives, um, you know, providing the ADU plans will also help the sure. code amendment. I'm, so there are a number of things, but I don't know if Will, you've got more to that. And I, I want to just, separate out that yeah. I, I don't mean regulatory. I, I mean, actual cash or, or um, tax deferred opportunities versus the market decides where we're building. I, I think um, I, I, we don't have a simple answer for that question. Um, so just up, but a couple of the pieces that go into us answering that question is first of all, so you can see we've got about 2000 units that are figured out or close to figured out. That's where those contingent units come in. There's 4,000 units remaining. The, um, the, uh, background that Alyssa provided earlier is that we're talking about 1,200 units per year, and our track record um, over a considerable time is 800 units per year. So that would point to us needing about 400 units per year that we have not gotten to with existing with the existing environment, and that's 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 existing regulatory environment, that's existing incentives, that's existing programs. It's it's the whole the whole mix of what it's like to be in Eugene. Um, so, so that at face value would say we need something more. I, I, we don't have an answer at this point about if those 400 units of additional, that's a 50% increase um, a year over year, um, or looking forward compared to the years past, uh, we don't have an answer about whether, um, what will be the critical lever to get us there. Certainly financial yeah. is a great one, but, but regulation we don't have the his, the experience or the history to say uh, regulation is not enough. My focus of that question is whether, <clears throat> as a policy discussion, we should be focusing on policies that affect the market or mm -hmm. policies that require us to come up with more money and subsidize. And I would prefer that we focus on the former rather than the latter. I think it would be more effective. Number two, would you say most of those 6,000 homes that we hope to see built will be single family homes or more than 50% would be multifamily homes? Your plan currently. Yeah, current, currently, um, and, and this is where I've, I've learned a lot from seeing uh, experience from planning, but I know we have, built, um, we have built a large number of multifamily homes. And so my, my simple math would be to say that we are seeing acute shortages on multifamily and single family um, homes right now. And we have gotten to this acute shortage in both by building a lot more multifamily than we had expected to build. So that suggests that going forward, we're going to need both. And, um, and it's going to be uh, with a high percentage of multifamily homes because I would, I would agree with the things you said. I would say that most should be single family homes of whatever sort, taking into account Alyssa's comment about ADUs and, and so forth, even though we average four or five a year, I'm hoping we might even get to 20 or 30 a year, but still that's not quite gonna scratch what the, the planning that at the scale we're talking about. Um, are we having conversations with the people who, uh, let me ask a better question. What part in the development of our planning do the people who actually build housing play? Where are you bringing in the folks who swing hammers and use saws and build these things? What, what role do they play in the process of developing your plans? 
I can tell you from a planning perspective that we involve them when we change regulations, when we update our policies. So they're definitely part of, in fact, there were folks sitting on the local boards and commissions. We reach out to home builders and that is definitely our stake, one of our many stakeholder groups we definitely reach out to. And particularly, you know, I can think of a good example is with Clear and Objective. They were very instrumental in telling us what they thought were barriers, um, just as much as, uh, you know, people who um, live in the, other people who live in the community are as well. But we do definitely involve them in our processes. Excellent. Um, I have 38 seconds. I may need a third round. Here's, I'll go fast. Um, if you look at these numbers and assume single family and market driven, the Housing that is affordable is built with economies of scale, large numbers of houses in a development versus one off. Currently, it, would you say it's it's true that our current plans to build density and not expanding the UGB drive this towards one offs or drive it towards developments? Melissa, do you have more that you can say about housing supply? Um, I am not 100% sure I'm, I'm tracking your question, Councillor Kirk. Are you saying, are we seeing more, more multifamily because of the economies of scale or efficiency or land efficiency? Land efficiency, and I'm saying single family homes are built most economically when they're built 50 to 100 at a time, as opposed to one off to fill a hole in somebody's neighborhood where there's an undeveloped lot. What are we seeing most of and what are you planning for? You know, I was gonna have, okay, I will have to get back to you on that. I haven't been tracking, you know, our subdivision permits coming in recently. I, you know, off the cuff, but I will confirm this. It does seem like it's smaller subdivisions that have been coming in, not the large, although we do get large master plans on occasion as well, but that's something I could definitely follow up on. I'd like a third round, please, Mayor, for another couple of questions. Okay, thank you, Greg, and then Claire. Um, one of the issues that um, is bothering me about this is our currency vacancy rate, which uh, you just stated a few moments ago, Will, was around two, two and a half percent. Um, that, to me, intones a more static uh, housing market than a dynamic housing market. And what I mean by this is, is that in previous to this particular time that we're in right now, there always used to be um, a situation where you had starter homes, then you had what I would call transitional housing, where people can get into a house for a few more years as their incomes increased, and then ultimately get into their dream homes, so to speak, as their incomes topped out. It, it, just, it, it just appears to me that we are really gonna, in, in addition to not having enough affordable units, we're not gonna have enough units for those transitional situations where young families want to move up the quality of housing and are unable to because that transitional or middle housing is not there. And we've talked about missing middle housing for the last, what, five years now. But I think we're really in a bind right now in terms of having those types of units available for young families for families whose in, incomes are going to be continuing to increase uh, to be able to make the next step forward. Instead, what we have, and it's not just in Eugene, we don't have a next step, we have a leap. And a lot of people will not be able to close that gap on the leap. So um, my, my additional is con concern is this, um, instead of the natural float down of uh, housing as more um, expensive units are built, uh, we're not getting that. Um, and so I, I just want to see if, there, if there's a way that we can create or 
augment that market so that we can have a better um, and more dynamic flow uh, within the realm of uh, our housing. I'm pausing in case anyone wants to respond to that in any way, but okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll move on to Claire and then the third round for, oh, and then a second round for Randy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just some thoughts uh, spurred by my colleagues' questions and statements. So on Randy's concern about current conditions in terms of labor shortage and uh, supply chain issues, I think it's important to keep in mind that this plan itself isn't, you know, is framed up to, to launch in uh, July of next year, right? So I, I know we still might be facing those issues. Um, we don't know when those things are gonna clear up, but um, it, the conditions will be different in, in some respect by then. Um, and yeah, on the vacancy rate, you know, I, I think that low vacancy rate just points to the fact that we don't have enough housing for all the people who are seeking it. And, and I don't know that it really matters what your income is because you're units, even if you have the means to pay more. Um, so, and then I just also wanted to agree with Randy um, about, you know, one of the things that's not necessarily in a, a housing implementation plan, but sh I think should be part of our policy and has has been in some respects is looking ways for ways to support home ownership um, while we're also strengthening our rent or protections. And multifamily housing can also involve uh, owner occupied units. It's not mutually exclusive. So I think that's something that we also have to keep in mind. Thanks. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Claire's right. I, we don't know what's going to happen next summer. You know, for, for this this plan, it's just always been my uh, my orientation to hope for the best, plan for the worst. Um, regarding um, comments made both by uh, Mike and Greg, uh, I, I just wanted to lend my voice to support for. Um, trying to find the most expeditious and efficient way to be adding more housing stock. And, you know, when, when we're doing, and Mike is right, when we're doing these one-offs, I mean, it, it's it's great to have infill, it's great uh, to, to work towards densification, but one house, one ADU at a time is not going to solve our, our big picture issues. And we're already beyond our projections for growth in the area. And I, I venture to say that that's uh, going to get worse as climate change uh, progresses. There's going to be climate refugees on top of everything else that we have through the natural progression. Um, I'll, I'll go back to also saying I would be interested, and I think we're going to have to revisit sooner rather than later, looking at our urban growth boundary. And while I'm certainly not in support of wide open, um, unmitigated, unmanaged sprawl, I think we really need to think in terms of what makes sense um, for developing more housing. And I'll also add um, more business sites uh, that produce the jobs that people need. So uh, that's all I had to, to add to the conversation. Uh, I will be looking forward to uh, more uh, instructive discussion about this as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, second round. I just have a quick question about something that Mike said. And I'm wondering if we have data for that. Do people actually buy a house and then upgrade and then upgrade again? Because when I made more money, I was just happy to be able to pay my bills, not look for a more expensive home. So I'm wondering if that trend is still something that happens and or if our, you know, these as new generations are getting older, if we have different trends or if we have no idea. I'm sure we have uh, some of each and um, we can figure, I don't think anyone here has the specific answer. So we can see if that's something that we've got um, as data that we can uh, provide. Yeah, I'm just curious. I'd like to better understand what people are doing. Thanks. Okay, Mike. 
For the record, my friend, it was Greg that mentioned the trade up stuff, but he's absolutely right. I do it every day, work with people to do that every day. So he's right. Um, I, Randy touched on this and I'm going to try and approach this in a dispassionate way here. Um, I, it was discussed earlier that um, the 07, 08 housing crash kind of threw a pall on the whole country, and that's true. Um, but we made it worse here, and I think we should be clear about that. If you look at permits over the for single-family homes over the course of time rather than average them over a complete set of time, in the years that go back to 08 and 07, there were times, for example, about 12 years ago, when I've done the look at all of the permit numbers to say, you know, 12 years ago, we were doing 800, 900 kinds of permits per year with single family homes. In 07 and 08, we dropped down to 100 and some a year, and it had a huge effect. And from there, in 09 and 10 and 11, we began to build back up and we got well over 300 in 2014. But in 15, when we set the UGB and added zero land for new residential housing, we dropped below 300. And we've stayed below 300 ever since. It's my proposition that when we did that, we said we're closed for business when it comes to building new single family homes. And my question is, is an analysis of the UGB efficiency, excuse me, sufficiency going to be a part of this process? I think that's a question for me. Um, so actually, uh, we will be updating our housing capacity analysis, which will include an urban growth boundary analysis um, under the umbrella of this project, but it's actually a requirement of state law that we have mm -hmm. completed by the end of 2026. And so if our housing capacity analysis says that we are short on land, we can, we can look at several things and we have to look first at, you know, can we provide those houses or sure. provide land for those homes inside the urban growth boundary, make more efficient use of our land, or we can expand the urban growth boundary or do a combination of both. So that is something that we will be looking at, you know, as, at the next as time. part of this so process. Or, I'm sorry. Well, it's under the umbrella of this process. So it's it, one of the, um, I can't remember which attachment it is, but it shows all of the process, all of the related projects that are under the umbrella of this and housing capacity and UGB analysis are both part of that. And I think the kickoff for those really will be the growth monitoring report that is you know, forthcoming. And that will really give us an idea of where we are in terms of our, our housing capacity and, and our use of land. And we'll do that analysis before policy decisions about what comes next. Right. And that's the way it's been set up to do. Correct. Excellent. Wonderful news. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, when we expanded the UGB for industrial in 2015, 17, however you want to call it, 18, when it was, you know, whatever. One of the things we talked about was the type of parcel and how we didn't have any hundred acre parcels and that was inhibiting us. And we, you know, it wasn't that we needed uh, X amount of land, we needed type of parcels. And I would like to see us add that to this discussion because um, housing subdivisions are, uh, it is my proposition that they're not capable of being built in Eugene anymore, anywhere near that they used to. And thus housing, single family housing that is affordable is nearly impossible to build. If all our policies are geared towards the one-off, that's the reason it's so expensive. That's the reason we don't have any. Lastly, I want to switch and say, um, are you counting 6th and 7th streets as a part of downtown? I can answer that. Um, we are using the downtown plan boundary, which um, is um, is just is one of the boundaries that's used to define downtown. And so I believe it starts, uh, it certainly goes north of 6th and 7th. Um, I can't remember if the Western boundary is Lawrence or Lincoln, but it, it runs from there all the way um, out to, uh, to the riverfront. Excellent. As I've said a couple of times, I'd like to see us do more specific work to incentivize multifamily housing being built on 6th and 7th. More of it. Lots more of it. And I think we should create, you know, the sort of incentives we have in other places with MUPTI and other dirty words like that 
to be able to create a lot more multifamily housing on the natural um, transportation corridors we have built for it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, I want to get back to this uh, cyclical no notion and try to square this circle a little bit. Um, you know, when I, when me and my wife bought our house in 2000, uh, we had to get 1900 square feet. Um, you know, when you have four kids uh, at different levels going in and out of the house, um, it becomes uh, challenging to make sure that, you know, everybody's got what they need. Um, right now, 20 years later, we can't get up and down the stairs like we used to. The kids are gone. And so our conversations are about downsizing. Where are we going to go? Where are we going to get a smaller unit where we don't have to cut the grass? We don't have to worry about the bushes. We don't have to worry about all these other things and, and higher taxes. Um, you know, how do we, and there's a lot of my colleagues that are in that same situation. You know, we're getting older and we don't need a big house anymore. We may need a, a smaller condo or apartment. And that is going to add to the supply of affordable housing that we need. I don't think that we're really taking a good long look at what that need is going to be. We have a need for people who don't have housing, period. We have a need for people who need to get adequate shelter over their heads. But that's going to run headlong into the need that other people have on fixed retirement incomes that are not going to be able to afford the housing they're in currently. So I, I just see a car wreck coming if we are not um, paying attention to the dynamics of how people are choosing to live and specifically choosing to live differently and choosing to live smaller, not bigger. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all of those comments. I actually just wanted to circle back on a couple of things people have said and just say, I mean, sort of traditionally, is cities have addressed housing needs by either creating more housing in a downtown core or building subdivisions. And the what we are now presented with with House Bill 2001 is to do that section in the middle, which is the, the sort of single family uh, housing subdivision that has been held kind of sacrosanct without changes. And so all the growth happens elsewhere. We don't actually know. So I'm hearing the concern about the, the one-off housing, but I think this legislation that it impacts our code one way or another starting next year is a, a little unknown, like how much housing that will actually add in the form of one-offs or more. And the intention certainly is to build a, more of that housing that is, you know, as, as Greg has said, that is like doesn't necessarily have a big backyard and is still close to transportation. So I do think that it's a little premature to assume that this idea of infill is not going to have an impact. It, it could have over the five year period of this plan, pretty big, big impact. And um, we, we don't know, but I, it feels to me that's why the anti-displacement policies are also going to be crucially important that we are worried about losing our what affordable stock we do have being replaced by something that's too expensive. So I really uh, appreciate this whole perspective of looking all the way through the continuum and under and helping us to actually see the relationships and the flow of how people move through housing and what our, what our housing stock is. And I very much look forward to the next work session on this topic. And with that, if no one else has any other comments, I, we are adjourned. Thank you.